This is Dr. Matifa Zahlachwayo Davis, the Director of Health for the City of St. Louis in America. She's an infectious diseases expert, which is how she became a regular medical contributor on CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Her CV includes serving as clinical instructor at the Washington University School of Medicine. She was also associate editor for Disparities and Competent Care for the Infectious Diseases Society in America. All this before the age of 40. This is Ralph Mpita. Ralph has been the MTN Group President and CEO since August of 2020. In 2021, Ralph was paid 84.2 million rands in recognition for the company's improved performance in the financial year. Do you know how good you have to be at your job for your company to pay you an equivalent of 5 million US dollars in a single year? This is Dr. Tatenda Shopera, the principal scientist at Pfizer in their bioprocess research and development department. Dr. Chopera was directly involved in the development of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine and was honored with the Breakthrough Science and Innovation Prize for the achievement. This is Ivan Nyamapene, a graduate of the University of Zimbabwe and a former ZESA engineer. Now he is the lead engineer and project manager on a multi-million pound project to create the first electric buses in London. This is Stephanie Travers, Tendai Mtawarira, Danai Gurira, Sikuli Lemoyo, and Tongai Chirisa. What do all these people have in common? Well, other than being giants in their respective fields, they also happen to be Zimbabwean. All of them. And it's because they are Zimbabwean that they have had to show their brilliance elsewhere. If Dr. Hlachwayo Davis was practicing in Zimbabwe, she probably would have been toy-toying in the parking lot at Parinyatwa two weeks ago. Danai Gurira would probably be on Twitter with the rest of us, complaining about how the Namas keep snubbing her plays every year. If Beast Mtawarira had stayed, who knows? Maybe things would have worked out the way he wanted to. But chances are, he probably would have had to become an accountant or a journalist who teaches rugby at Chechi on the weekends. Because that's what Zimbabwe does. It forces you to compromise with your dreams and talents, to continuously renegotiate between what you know you were born to do and what is practical for you to survive. It does that to you until the most logical thing to do is to leave. Which is why our question this week is, how much has Zimbabwe lost to brain drain. Ladies and gentlemen, war vets and unfocused youth, welcome to another episode of Propaganda with Kandoro. Emigration from Zimbabwe is not really new. During colonial times, there was seasonal emigration to South Africa to work in the mines. Kujoni. Immediately after Zimbabwe's independence, about 60,000 whites left the country because, well, who knows why they left. It wasn't until the mid-90s that black Zimbabweans also realized that something was starting to smell very fishy. Economically, ESAP, war vets payments, food strikes, land invasions. Those with the means booked one-way flights to greener, colder, and racist pastures. As the situation continued to deteriorate, the numbers of those who were leaving kept increasing. Teachers, doctors, engineers, nurses, all gone. In 2008, the education sector almost collapsed as educators kept leaving in droves when they realized that the economy had also launched Operation Mrambazim Dola. For five years during the government of national unity, things were critical but stable, which is why it was very confusing when the terrible twins got the brilliant idea to de-dollarize in 2016. Predictably, things went back to factory settings. But not everyone who has left has left because of the Zim Dollar economy and Zim Dollar salaries. And it would be very dishonest of me to allege so. The continued lack of stability in the economy is a major reason, yes. But there's been other reasons. High up on that list of other reasons, 
that people end up living is poor working environments. Take a look at this video. There is no urgency, there's no priority, and nobody is listening to us. Mm -hmm. I've written a million lists, I've knocked on a thousand doors. I come to work and I do my very best, but my output are stillbirths, my output are disabled babies. Elective lists are not being done. We wait for it to become an emergency. When it becomes an emergency, I'm given a baby who has hypoxic brain injury. This child now has permanent disability. This is not acceptable. That's Dr. Aza Mashumba. And back in 2019 when the video was taken, she was the head of pediatrics at Parenyatwa. I don't know if she's still there. She probably left. But even if she did, can you blame her? Do you know how bad things have to be for a doctor to publicly show their emotion like that? These are people that are trained, specifically trained to keep their emotions in check. And here she is, publicly crying because things are bad. At the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, doctors had to strike for basic PPE. And it was during that strike that we started hearing just how bad things had got. Some doctors had had to perform bare-handed surgeries, plastic bags being used to collect patients' urine, plastic bags at surgical caps. The CEO of Daily Board, Anthony Manduanza, just announced that he will be stepping down as CEO at the end of September, allowing Messindoro, the current group financial director, to take over. Manduanza has been the CEO of Dairy Board for the past 25 years. 25 years. I'm turning 30 in September. That means Manduanza has been CEO since I was five years old. This man was CEO before cell phones were a thing. What fresh ideas could he still be sharing after two decades? If the CEO is not changing, that means everyone below him stays in the same position or they have to leave if they have ambitions to rise through the ranks. How many brilliant executives do you think left Daily Board in the past two decades after realizing that there would be no reasonable upward mobility? In some industries, let me rephrase that. In most industries, you also have to deal with the heavy-handedness of the state. You speak out of turn or you offend the powers that be and the boys will come and find you. Granted, things are not as bad as they used to be when Gabriel was in power. But that's not saying a lot. Wolf Mbanga and James Makamba are just two of the many high-profile journalists and broadcasters who had to spend decades in the diaspora for offenses better known by those in the CIO. These tensions existed until the day Gabriel was removed from power, which tells you all you need to know about whatever they were being accused of. These are people whose organizations employed hundreds of people between them. Who knows where Zimbabwe's broadcasting industry would be if Makamba's Joy TV had not been shut down back in 2002. But even if your job pays you in US dollars, and as a decent work environment, and you don't have to deal with the state, it's still not enough to protect you from poor service delivery. Best water pipes lead to inconsistent water provisions, and non-functioning traffic lights turn into hours of congestion. If you live on the other side of Samora that requires you to use Robert Ngabe as a way back to your family, you might need to find a new family. But even if you're a resident of Borodo Brook, a portal will find you and ruin your day. Let's not even speak about Zesa. Imagine living in a country where waste collection is non-existent. Then you wake up to the news that waste collection tariffs have been reviewed and increased. Like, make it make sense. And if Monica Mchangwa is to be believed, the government intends to bring this scam to a city near you. All we are asking for is for the government to create an environment where ideas and businesses thrive based on merit, not strategic allegiances. A little predictability would go a long way. Not this current situation where we have as many statutory instruments as the zeros on our currency. It's become very common to see civilian cars that have Zano PF stickers on their windscreen. This is a letter from the National Army dated 1 July 2022 and it reads, This letter serves to allow JB Family Electronics Trading in Bari to do business without hindrance whatsoever, be it political, business 
or any circumstances therein. Disruptions of such will result in JB Electronics trading failure to support or donate to the national cause as the company regularly does in uplifting the nation's aspirations. I know I sound like a broken record at this point, but there is a simple solution to all this. Just fix the economy and everything will fall into place. At the very least, let's see that you're trying. You know how in John Wick, they have all these rules and one of the rules says there is no killing on continental grounds. We need something like that from Zanopia. There is no stealing or looting for the next year. I know a year is a lot to ask for, maybe, maybe six months. Let's start there and see if things don't change for our beautiful country. There are Zimbabweans who moved back home after the happenings <laughs> of November 2017. They too thought the country was headed towards Canaan in a new dispensation. They were soon to find out that business was only open on social media. A veteran journalist Gilbert Nyamavu was one of those people who returned to Zimbabwe to join ZBC as the head of news and current affairs. For 18 months, reports say everything was going well until an incident involving coverage of the first family happened. Nyamavu is said to have suspended a cameraman we had broken company rules. But because of that cameraman's connections, Nyamavu was summoned to a very high office for a very public dress down. He was immediately demoted to ZBC's digital department. And if you know anything about ZBC, you know that's a non-existent department. ZBC and digital. Come on. <laughs> Earlier this year, Nyamavu left the ZBC and returned to the UK. He's not the only person who had his hopes betrayed. I don't know how much Zimbabwe has lost to brain drain. I don't know how we would even begin to calculate something like that. But I don't think I would be far off if I just assumed that is a very high number. Just look at the positions we occupy in some of the countries that we've started to call home. Just look at the contributions. Just look at the level of involvement. We have Zimbabweans becoming mayors. Just imagine what Zimbabwe would look like if these people could contribute to their own country. If it was even remotely feasible for them to do so. Something's gotta give. Something has to change. Because being a prophet can't be the most sustainable business in Zimbabwe. It can't. 2023 is coming. This has been another episode of Propaganda with Kandoro. I'll catch you guys next week.